Welcome back. We are now going to discuss the clinical aspects of the neoplasia and uh, this section uh, particularly deals with the, the differentiation between the malignant and the benign tumors. Okay, the benign tumors are uh, well demarcated and they are movable. Generally speaking, the, uh, let's say for example, we have a papilloma, we have a fibroma, we have a lipoma, we have benign schwannoma, we have a neurofibromatoma. All of them would share a similar feature of being well demarcated and being movable on the underlying structures. However, if the uh, structure, a swelling or a lump, if it seems to be fixed or indurated and the clinician is not able to move it, uh, then uh, it raises a suspicion for the carcinomatous or the malignant nature of that swelling. Uh, say for example, we have a, uh, we are having a swelling on the skin and uh, we want to differentiate it between the papilloma or uh, from the epidermoid carcinoma. And uh, if we see that uh, the swelling is movable on the skin, then we would raise uh, the, our judgment towards the papilloma. And if the swelling seems to be fixed, then we would uh, judge towards and think towards the uh, epidermoid carcinoma. The rate of the growth is slow in case of the benign tumors and it's not very hard to think uh, uh, this uh, point because uh, if we see that uh, the benign tumors are not going to metastasize by definition then obviously they would be slow in growth however uh, the this is a general idea and this is general principle that uh, uh, benign tumors are slow growing however there are many exceptions for the same that the tumors may be fast growing however they may absolutely do not have a potential to metastasize uh, which would obviously be the benign tumor uh, in contrast the malignant tumor are fast growing and again this can be thought of uh, in the same way that the benign malignant tumors are going to metastasize uh, so they should have the ability to grow fast However, uh, again, this is a general principle and some tumors may be slow growing and may present later in life. Okay, now uh, the third point would be that uh, benign tumors are well differentiated. The benign tumors are well differentiated. Oh, the, uh, this point uh, often uh, we can see that uh, histologically uh, many a times the benign tumors cannot be differentiated from the normal tissue parenchyma and uh, the malignant uh, uh, tumors are usually poorly differentiated and often this uh, uh, principle uh, is also important in case of the grading of the tumor. In case of the grading of the tumor, uh, more poorly differentiated a tumor is, the more poor the prognosis. More poorly differentiated tumor is, the poorer the prognosis. Or a tumor may also be anaplastic, uh, and which means that the tumor is a uh, highly undifferentiated tumor. There, there, there is no differentiation at all in the cells. And we just see some sort of a cell, cells which, are, which we cannot identify that they are epithelioid or they are, they are mesenchymal in origin. Uh, absolutely, we cannot judge uh, without the, some other uh, laboratory measures such as immunohistochemistry. Uh, which, we, which we will talk about later in the series. Uh, now the benign tumors are uh, by definition they absolutely don't metastasize. Absolutely. The tumors don't metastasize and uh, uh, con in contrast the malignant tumors have the metastatic potential. Now metastatic potential over here uh, means that uh, the the tumor has the ability to spread to a distant site. However, the potential, uh, however, the uh, malignant tumor itself may not spread. Okay, the malignant tumor uh, has the ability to spread, but it may not spread. Again, it has the ability to spread. However, it may not spread. It may remain localized over there.
So these are some classical clinical features that uh, we would expect in the benign and the malignant tumors. Biopsy and excision are the absolute diagnostic feature for the cancer. We, a benign tumor may present as malignant or malignant may otherwise present as benign. And for absolute diagnosis of the tumor, we need to do the biopsy. Uh, let's say, for example, we have a, a prostate cancer patient and uh, surgically we have removed the prostate and now the patient comes after a year or so and we see that the uh, PSA, the prostate specific antigen is raised. Now, there are many causes for the PSA to be raised and uh, if uh, if we want to diagnose that uh, it's because of the cancer again, then we need to do the uh, biopsy again and verify and if we want to stamp it uh, as the prostate cancer, we must look under the microscope. Let's discuss the histologic differences between the benign and the malignant tumors. The benign tumors are well differentiated. Note that the benign tumors have no metastatic potential as per definition. So uh, these guys don't want to uh, spread and uh, therefore they would be having less meta less mitosis. Now, if they are having less amount of mitosis, then actually they would be converting, uh, they would be getting differentiated. Now, if the cells are well differentiated, then they would obviously having the normal nuclear morphology and having no nuclear morphology, they are well differentiated. Uh, they would also be having uh, no pleomorphism or less pleomorphism. Now, since these cells having less mitosis, therefore we can say that they are invading less. They uh, they don't want to invade. They they their their cell number is almost limited. They take long time to grow. Uh, in contrast to these features, the malignant tumors are anaplastic or poorly differentiated. That's because we uh, have high mitotic activity. We have high mitotic activity and these cells have so much so high mitotic activity that they don't care what is the shape and the size. They just want to divide and since they have high mitotic activity, we can say that uh, their nuclear uh, hyperchromicity would be there and even more their nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio would be high enough uh, because uh, the cells which are actively dividing have uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio high enough. Now, high mitotic activity generally is suggestive of uh, high power of invasion because the cells are actively dividing and they would obviously invade, they would invade the surrounding area and that would be uh, obviously the local invasion. On the left, I have kept the slide of the benign tumor of the thyroid and on the right is the malignant tumor of the thyroid. Here you can appreciate the um, cuboidal cells, the follicular cells of the thyroid gland and uh, the, the stroma which we can appreciate. Now, uh, sorry, the proteinaceous substance in between the cells. Uh, however, in this uh, this slide, we are uh, only able to establish that these cells have the hyperchromic nuclei and the nuclei have many lobes over here. Nucleus is somewhat hyperchromic. However, I cannot uh, strictly identify that this is a slide of a thyroid and actually I do not see anything over here. This is very poorly differentiated slide and that's what makes it a malignant tumor. For further diagnosis, I need to uh, establish a connection with the tumor markers and uh, the lab diagnostic measures like the uh, immunohistochemistry methods uh, to stamp that this is a thyroid carcinoma. However, in case of the benign tumor, I can uh, readily see that this tumor has uh, uh, a good amount of differentiated uh, follicular cells and uh, uh, actually this slide is of the adenolipoma of the thyroid and uh, we are able to see the fat also over here these white spaces are the fat so uh, that's all so the takeaway message would be that uh, the benign tumors are well differentiated while the malignant tumors are uh, poorly differentiated and uh, this uh, the malignant tumors have hyperchromic nuclei along with pleomorphism present whereas in case of the benign tumors the pleomorphism is absent 
the, I am able to identify the cells and they are similar to the normal uh, morpho morphology of the uh, organ itself. So these were some uh, high principles regarding the histologic features of the benign and the malignant tumors. It should be noted, however, that uh, these are some hammer home messages. And I want you to remember all these uh, points. However, in the back of your mind, just keep this thing that uh, uh, these are not the absolute features. They are seen in most of the tumors, but they, they are not just the absolute features. There are exceptions uh, which don't uh, follow these principles. The effects of the tumor depends upon where its location, what it secretes and the immune response of our body. Now, the uh, tissue or uh, sorry, a neoplastic tissue that is growing would obviously damage its surrounding tissue and it would pressurize or compress the normal tissue and uh, ra rather speaking that uh, even if the tumor is benign let's say we have the pituitary adenoma and uh, a size of one centimeter also would uh, uh, compress the normal pituitary tissue and this would in turn cause hypopituitarism now uh, now sometimes the tumor secretes uh, uh, hormones or growth factors and uh, example for this would be the beta cell adenoma of the pancreas which would be producing enough insulin and uh, the insulin will cause hypoglycemia. Now uh, in this example I have taken the uh, adenoma of a hormone secreting gland however it should be noted <coughs> sorry that uh, the the most of the time the benign tumors uh, cause a hormone related problem even if they are of a non endocrine nature now uh, two things uh, are here uh, said in this line that uh, the most of the time the hormone secreting tumors are benign in nature and uh, they form a non endocrine part but uh, um, let's take some another example from this uh, message that uh, say for example we have small cell carcinoma of lung small cell carcinoma of the lung and uh, uh, this tumor uh, is actually most of the time it produces ACTH so uh, this would be uh, inducing the Cushing syndrome now but the this is carcinoma so it is malignant and it is secreting ACTH so uh, it is secreting some hormone so uh, it should be kept in mind that uh, this this feature is present most of the time that the benign tumors uh, are usually hormone uh, if the if the tumor is hormone secreting then normally it would be uh, or most of the time it would be benign but uh, uh, the this this is not the uh, case always as you can see in the small cell carcinoma it would be producing ACTH so uh, just keep this in your mind now the cachexia uh, a cancer cachexia is the decrease in the weight decrease in the weight due to the loss of the fat and the lean muscle and there would be elevated basal metabolic rate also now the cancer cell itself would be producing a, a immune response against its itself so the, there would be cachexia produced now immune response would produce the macrophages remember would be producing tnf alpha and the TNF alpha is uh, uh, thought to be the cause of the cachexia produced in case of the cancer. It's, it's the main, uh, it, it's one of the many uh, reasons of the cachexia. So, um, okay. Now, now for the uh, ulceration and secondary infection, the idea here is that uh, if a tumor, uh, for example, is growing towards the mucosal surface or the skin or anything where the microbes can infect this would cause the secondary infection and uh, if it's disturbed or it dist uh, the blood vessels are nearby then it can cause uh, even bleeding now we need to understand the paraneoplastic syndrome para means besides local so Sometimes there are some effects or the signs and symptoms which cannot be explained by the local mechanisms or the local invasion of the tumor. Uh, that is, uh, I cannot explain those mechan. I cannot uh, explain the symptoms because of the local effects, the compression of the surrounding tissues. 
Now there are different mechanisms for the um, this paraneoplastic syndrome is that there can be a hormone secreting tumor. For example, we have a small cell carcinoma of the lung which generally secretes ACTH and the ACTH in turn would be causing the Cushing syndrome. Uh, another example would be the breast carcinoma which secretes the, um, the parathyroid hormone related protein the PTHRP and that would cause hypercalcemia and uh, sometimes the renal carcinoma also may cause hypercalcemia due to the PTHRP. Now the second mechanism would be the antibodies that cross react uh, antibodies that react against the cross reacted tumor cells. Now the idea here is that the tumor cells uh, of say a, a bronchogenic carcinoma uh, would cross react with the neuronal cell antigens and uh, this would cause the myasthenia. Now uh, this this all the first of all uh, let's go one step back and think again that bronchogenic carcinoma has tumor cells. The tumor cells have initiated an inflammation. They have initiated the immune cell response. And now the tumor cells themselves cross react with the neuronal cell antigens. And this uh, immune cells would actually be attacking the tumor cells. But since they have cross reacted against with the neuronal cell antigens, therefore it, this would damage our own tissue and cause myasthenia. Now, the third mechanism would be that uh, sometimes the tumor, as in case of the acute promyelocytic leukemia, would be causing disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is commonly associated and uh, this is something that you need to remember. Um, okay. So these were some general principles regarding the difference between the benign and the malignant tumors and their effects. In the next lecture, we would be discussing about the lab diagnosis, immunohistochemistry, tumor markers, grading and the staging of the tumors.